A very good evening, aspirants. I have a very good announcement for you. See, as prelims is nearing, I know mock test is being integral part of your preparation. But still, just to help you to achieve your goal, Shankarai's Academy is providing you free prelims mock test. See, the test will be conducted across 13 centers, both online and offline mode. And to take the test, you just have to register with the link given in the description below. The test will be conducted on three different dates. First test will be on 15th of May 2022. Second test will be on 22nd. And third test will be on 29th of May 2022. Use this opportunity wisely. And with this positive note, now let us get into the list of articles for today's discussion. Today's date is 28th of April 2022. So these are the list of news articles we have chosen today for the discussion. We have four different news articles. In this first news article discussion, we'll be discussing about how hydrogen will be an alternative for fossil fuels. Then in the second news article discussion, we'll be discussing about value addition tax or VAT. In this third news article discussion, we'll be discussing about bird flu. And finally, we'll end our discussion by seeing an important article regarding mehalits. So now without wasting much time, let us get into the news article discussion. Today, let us start our news article discussion with this editorial article. Look at this article. This editorial is with reference to India's green hydrogen policy, which was released on February 17, 2022. See, this policy was aimed at boosting the domestic production of green hydrogen to 5 million tons by 2030. And this policy also aims in making India an export hub for the clean fuel. See, the policy has also addressed several critical challenges such as open access, waiver of interstate transmission charges, banking, time-bound clearance, etc. And it is expected to boost India's energy transition. Note that India is the world's third largest energy consuming country and India's energy demand is expected to increase in the coming years. So in this scenario, hydrogen as a fuel holds significant advantage for India's energy independence. So this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, we'll learn about the advantages of hydrogen fuel and the challenges associated with it. Then we'll also discuss about five-step strategy to harness the potential of hydrogen fuel in India. So this is how the discussion is going to be. And before that, the syllabus relevant to this article is highlighted here for your reference. Just go through it. First, we'll see the significance of hydrogen fuel. See, hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. It is lighter, energy dense and three times more efficient than burning petrol. We know that India's electricity is heavily coal dependent, right? So hydrogen has the potential to replace fossil fuels and can address pollution. Hydrogen can also play a major role in the decarbonization of India's transport sector. We know that hydrogen fuel cells provides an inherently clean source of energy as the byproducts or simply heat and water. The advantages of fuel cell vehicles over battery electric vehicles or faster fueling and long driving range thereby making them ideal for long haul transportation which is a major constraint with lithium ion batteries. So to sum up, hydrogen is the most abundant element. It is lighter and energy dense and it is three times more efficient than burning petrol. Hydrogen have the potential to replace fossil fuels and can address pollution. Thereby, it actually plays a major role in decarbonization of India's transport sector. Hydrogen fuel cells also help us a lot because they provide clean source of energy on one hand and on the other hand the byproduct of the process is simply heat and water which does not cause any harm to the environment and finally the advantage of fuel cell vehicles is that they are faster fueling long driving range and they are ideal for long haul transportation these were the constraints with lithium ion batteries but hydrogen defeats all these challenges now we'll look into the challenges associated with hydrogen fuel. See India's hydrogen consumption was around 7 mt in 2020 and according to the Energy and Research Institute or TERAI, it is anticipated to increase to about 35 mt by 2050. 
See, one of the efficient methods of producing hydrogen is using the electrolytic processes. But this process consumes large amount of electricity. On the basis of this, to produce 35 MT, India would require a tentative capacity in the range of 192 gigawatt to 224 gigawatt of electrolyzers by 2050. But the irony is that global capacity of electrolyzers has just crossed 30 megawatt in 2021. This means that India itself would require an electrolyzer capacity of 642 750 times the current global capacity by 2050. So it looks like a distinct dream for India, right? Apart from the ever increasing electricity demand, the high cost of hydrogen manufacturing and water scarcity could also pose a challenge. See, production of 1 kilogram of hydrogen by electrolysis requires around 9 liters of water. Therefore, hydrogen project planning should be holistic and targeted in areas that are not water scarce. Now, to address the challenges, the author suggests a 5-step strategy both on the demand side and supply side. Now, we'll first see the 5-step strategy on the demand side. Firstly, to create an initial demand, adequate incentives should be given to industries such as refining and fertilizers. And the industries should be mandated to produce certain quantities of hydrogen energy every year. Secondly, industries which are manufacturing low emission hydrogen based products need to be incentivized by government policies. For example, green steel and green cement manufacturing industries. Thirdly, blending hydrogen with natural gas can act as a big booster shot which can be facilitated by framing, blending mandates and promoting Hutch CNG or hydrogen CNG stations. Hutch CNG is nothing but a hydrogen enriched compressed natural gas. It is cleaner and more economical. Further, to promote fuel cell, electric vehicles or FCEVs, hydrogen fuel stations may be planned on dedicated corridors where long distance trucking is widespread. Lastly, the concept of carbon tariffs need to be introduced in India on the lines of European countries. For those who are not aware, to tell it in simple words, a carbon tariff is a tax imposed on imported goods from countries that do not curb their emissions of greenhouse gases. Carbon taxes not only capture the cost of negative externalities but would also incentivize and encourage firms to switch to cleaner and greener means of production which would be beneficial to both the environment and the economy. Hence it would be advantageous if such a tax were introduced in India. Now we'll see the five step strategy on the supply side. Firstly, investment in R&D should be accelerated to bring the cost of hydrogen at par with fossils. Secondly, sustainable alternative towards affordable transportation or SATAT scheme with a target to produce 15 MMT of compressed biogas could be leveraged by exploring biogas conversion into hydrogen. Thirdly, to commercialize and scale up nascent technologies a viable gap funding or VGF scheme may be introduced for hydrogen based projects. Viability gap funding or VGF is designed to provide capital support to PPP projects which would not otherwise be financially viable. See, this fund has the effect of reducing the revenue required to recover cost and provide a financially attractive returns for the private sector. Further, to secure affordable financing, electrolyzers, manufacturing and hydrogen projects need to be brought under priority sector lending or PSL so that the electrolyzer manufacturers will get easy credit at a low interest rate. Lastly, thrust should be on reducing the cost of electrolyzers by implementing the production link incentive or PLA scheme. Know that the two dominant cost factors for green hydrogen or renewable energy tariffs and electrolyzer cost and India has the advantage of one of the lowest renewable tariffs. So reducing the cost of electrolyzers could help India become a global hub for electrolyzer manufacturing and green hydrogen. 
see hydrogen has the potential to completely transfer india's energy ecosystem by shifting its trajectory from an energy importer to a dominant exporter over the next few decades with hydrogen india could lead the world in achieving paris agreement's goal to limit global warming to 2 degrees celsius compared to pre-industrial levels hydrogen could lay the foundation of a new india which would be energy independent a global climate leader and international energy power apart from this remember hydrogen fulfills three e's of india's energy road map that is energy security energy sustainability and energy access and according to the editorial article india should strive to seize one more e that is economic opportunity so that industries can be encouraged to its full potential see hydrogen will certainly play a decisive role in india's net zero ambition by 2070 and in making india atmanirbhar in energy so that's all about this editorial article in this editorial article we saw about significance of hydrogen fuel then we saw some of the challenges associated with hydrogen fuel and we saw five step strategy both on the demand side and supply side to address the challenges posed so on the demand side firstly there must be an initial demand and for that adequate incentives should be given secondly industries which are manufacturing low emission hydrogen based products need to be incentivized by government policies thirdly blending hydrogen with natural gas should be encouraged and further to promote fuel cell electric vehicles hydrogen fuel stations may be planned on dedicated corridors where long distance trucking is widespread and finally the concept of carbon tariff needed to be introduced in india so now looking at the supply side firstly investment in r&d should be accelerated secondly sustainable alternative towards affordable transportation scheme must be introduced thirdly to commercialize and scale up nascent technologies a viable gap funding scheme may be introduced further to secure affordable financing electrolyzer manufacturing and hydrogen projects need to be brought under priority sector lending or psl lastly thrust should be on reducing the cost of electrolyzers by implementing the pli or production link incentive scheme so with these insights now let us move on to the next news article discussion now for our next discussion let us take up this news article see the news article talks about the response by opposition to the pm's remark on value added tax or vat on petrol and diesel the news is not important but vat is important so let us know what vat is firstly know that vat or value added tax was introduced in 2005 in india it was introduced on the recommendation of the report of the indirect taxation enquiry committee 1978 which is also known as lk ja committee so have this basic understanding it was introduced to eliminate the presence of double taxation and the cascading effect from the then existing sales tax structure so it was brought to eliminate the double taxation and the cascading effect which was caused due to the sales tax structure so if you are not aware about this term cascading effect a cascading effect is when there is tax levied on a product at every step of the sale in the previous sales tax structure the tax is levied on a value which includes tax paid by the previous buyer so the consumer ends up paying tax on already paid tax this obviously leads to double taxation right this was avoided by what but if you remember gst that is goods and services tax also was brought in with the aim of eliminating cascading effect of taxes and simplifying the indirect tax structure right then did gst subsume vat this might be your doubt see gst replaced vat on most goods but on some goods vat continues to be the tax levied on them very important point if at all there was a question in upsc prelims that vat completely was eradicated it is a false statement it is still levied on certain goods now specifically talking about vat vat is an indirect tax as you know indirect tax means that is imposed on someone but its burden can be shifted to someone else so let us see how this happens in vat see vat is levied on goods and services for value added at every point of production or distribution cycle 
So, for example, take a two-wheeler. Manufacturing of two-wheeler consists of different processes, right? In every process, a value is added to finally arrive at that desired two-wheeler, right? So, under VAT system, every time when value is added, tax is levied. So, from raw materials to the final retail purchase, that is sale to the consumer, VAT is imposed. Here, the amount of value addition is first identified at each stage and then tax is levied on the same. So, here ultimately, the end consumer has to pay the complete VAT while buying goods. What this means is, buyers at earlier stages of production receive reimbursement of tax they have paid. This happens because the consumer bears the entire tax. So, consumers are not only paying for the VAT of the entire product at hand, but also for the entire process of production. As the consumers ultimately bear the taxes, it is also known as a consumption tax. I hope you can understand what is happening here. But here also you might get a confusion, like there might be a double taxation. Or you might have a doubt like how it actually avoids cascading effect. See, after the first sale within the state, at every subsequent point of sale, the tax is payable only on the value addition. So, the new value that is added to that good or service is only taxed here. There is no tax on already paid tax. And all transactions take place through invoices showing tax separately. So, the system is very transparent. Then, how it avoids double taxation? See that taxpayers will receive credit for tax already paid on procurement stages, thereby avoiding double taxation. Now know that each state has its own VAT laws for proper implementation and levying. So different states apply different VAT rates according to their implied laws. One of the major benefits of VAT is it ensures better compliance since the tax is levied at each stage. So that's all you have to know about VAT system. Very, very important economic topic that you have to revise for your preliminary examination. Make note of all the points which I have mentioned. With these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. For our next discussion, let us take up this news article. The news article mentions that a first human case of a bird flu has been reported in China. Here we are talking about the bird flu strain H3N8. So first let us understand what is bird flu and we'll see few informations about H3N8. See bird flu is also known as avian influenza or AI. It refers to the disease caused by infection with avian influenza type A viruses. It is very contagious among birds. See these viruses they naturally spread among wild aquatic birds worldwide. Here wild aquatic birds include water birds or waterfowl such as ducks, geese, swans, gulls, terns and shore birds. See among these dabbling ducks. They are considered reservoirs of type A viruses but the ducks may not get sick. Here also know that influenza A virus have been detected and are known to circulate in seven different animal species or groups also. This includes domestic poultry, other bird species, swine, horses, dogs and bats. Now this avian influenza virus has multiple strains or types. These strains can be divided into two based on its ability to cause disease in poultry. They are highly pathogenic avian influenza which is also called as HPAI and low pathogenic avian influenza which is also called as LPAI. So in this LPAI is a natural infection of waterfowl that may cause minimal impacts or no sign of disease in domestic poultry and wild birds. So LPAI is not a serious threat. On the other hand, HPAI is a serious one as it causes severe disease in domestic poultry and therefore is associated with their high death rate. But know that HPAI is rarely found in waterfowl. Other than these classification, there are also subtypes of avian influenza viruses based on the two proteins that the virus have on their surfaces. These two proteins are hemagglutinin which is denoted by capital H and neuraminidase which is denoted by capital N. 
Overall, there are 16 recognized hatch types and 9 N types identified in birds. These are known to occur in a number of different combinations as well. Remember, among these different subtypes, H5 and H7 are known to include highly pathogenic viruses. And particularly, H5N1 is the cause for current concern. H5N1 causes disease in chickens and some other species of birds. So, have this basic understanding. So, so far, I hope you could understand what is this bird flu, which is also known as avian influenza. And I hope you can understand what this code H3N8 actually means. H is nothing but a protein called hemagglutinin and N is nothing but a protein called neuraminidase. Overall, there are 16 recognized H type and 9 N types and they can occur in a number of different combinations. So, one such combination is H5N1. This combination is really a very dangerous one. And the news mentions another strain, H3N8. So now let us know how this virus is transmitted. See, virus is shed in the saliva, nozzle secretions and feces of infected birds. So when birds come in contact with these or the surfaces contaminated with virus, they get affected. As simple as that, this means open air markets where eggs and birds are sold in crowded and unsanitary conditions can spread the disease. Now let us see how the virus impacts the birds. See this infection affects multiple internal organs mainly the intestines and the respiratory tract of the birds. Some of these viruses even kill certain domesticated bird species such as chickens, ducks and turkeys. For example, H5N1 which we just saw has a mortality rate of 90 to 100%. So now a question occurs here. Can humans get affected with AI virus? See actually AI viruses do not normally infect humans however occasionally human infections have occurred. For example, H5N1 can be transmitted to humans. It happens only when humans come into close contact with infected birds. That means people having job related or recreational exposure to birds can be affected. But if humans get it, then it causes rapid deterioration and high fatality. H5N1 has caused the largest number of reported cases of severe disease and death in humans. The only relief here is so far the virus has not been shown to spread from person to person. Well, is there any treatment available? See, actually for humans, treatment with flu antiviral drugs is suggested as soon as symptoms begin. It could include medicines such as Oseltamivir or Tamiflu or Zenamivir relenza. But remember, there is no bird flu vaccine. So to conclude, in rare cases, it can affect humans and the news is one such rare case. It says that one human case of H3N8 virus has been detected. See, as I already said, AI circulates in different animal species. This H3N8 routinely circulates and can cause illness in horses. And it is called equine influenza A virus. Equine means horse. As per the news, the infection was caused due to the contact with chickens and crows. So it is advisable to steer clear of birds and poultry at this moment. So that's all you have to know about bird flu. In this news article discussion, we saw in detail about bird flu. We saw about its causes and we also saw some of the information about H3N8 virus strains. So these learn points. Now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now for our final news article discussion, let us take up this article. The news article mentions that a Mehalith burial cluster has been excavated in Karnataka. First let us understand what is Mehalith burial cluster, then we will see the news. See first of all understand this, Meha means large, Lithic means stone. Therefore Mehalith means a built of large stone and a Mehalith site means a site having large stone structures. See, generally these mehalits are huge undressed stones. These structures often throw light on building activities and way of living in the past. The one you see in this image is mehalith. In the past, these mehalits or big stone boulders were carefully arranged by people and mostly they were used to mark burial sites. So, such mehalith is a grave or memorial stone. 
Some mehalits can be seen on the surface. Other mehalit burials are often underground. Sometimes archaeologists they find a circle of stone boulders or a single large stone standing on the ground. These are the only indications that there are burials beneath. Actually, there are various mehalit types. Let me explain about them one by one. First is the stone circles. It refers to standing stones arranged in a circle or in the form of an eclipse or more rarely a setting of four stones laid on an arc of a circle like you can see in the image given here. Secondly, dolmens. This is a type of mehalith which is a rectangular box like chamber. It is constructed with four slabs and fifth slab is used as the cap stone. And third type is cyst burials. See, cyst is shaped like a coffin. So, it was used as encasements for dead bodies. Then comes the pit burials. It is a sepulchral mehalith. That is, it contains the mortal remains of one or more human beings. These are unlined excavations where the remains are buried with a variety of surface markers like cairns or boulder circles, etc. A cane is a human made pile of stones often in conical form like you can see in the image and finally menher menher means single long stones placed upright see know that often these burials have some common features in India generally the dead people are buried with distinctive pots tools and weapons of iron skeleton of horses horse equipment and ornaments of stone and gold etc also know that the monolithic culture has no regional bounds so it could be found in Europe, Africa and in Asia. Particularly in India it was abundant in our culture. According to NCRT the practice of placing mehalits began about 3000 years ago. This practice was prevalent throughout the Deccan, South India, in the Northeast and in Kashmir. Some important mehalithic sites are Adichanallur in Tamil Nadu and Brahmagiri in Karnataka. So make note of these points very important. Now coming to some of the important points mentioned in the news article. See the news mentions about a burial cluster excavated in Karnataka. It has been excavated at Budipadaga in Hanur Taluk. It is near Kollegal in Chamarajanagar district. This site adjoins the Bilikiri Ranganatha Swami Temple Tiger Reserve and Malai Mahadeshwara Hills Wildlife Sanctuary. There are three burial sites of different sizes at the cluster. They are in the form of crane circles or stone circle with boulders. The largest mehalit at the site is 9 meters in diameter. One of the important feature is this site is close to an ancient human habitation found in Budipadaga. This human habitation belonged to the Iron Age. Broken fragments of pottery and animal bones were found at this site. So, Budipadaga site is a rare finding where both human habitation and burial clusters are in close proximity. Such a finding indicates continuity of a culture that existed since prehistoric times in the region. So, these are all some of the important points that you have to make note of. So, with these learned points, now let us move on to the next part of the news article discussion which is nothing but the preliminary practice questions. Now look at this first question. This question is about value added tax. You have to find which one of the following is not a feature of value added tax. Option A it is a multi-point destination based system of taxation. Option B it is a tax levied on value addition at each stage of transaction in the production distribution chain. Option C it is a tax on the final consumption of goods or services and must ultimately be borne by the consumer. Option D, it is basically subject of the central government and the state governments or only a facilitator for its successful implementation. See, we saw statement B and C during our discussion itself. Now coming to statement D, it says VAT is a union subject. It is incorrect because VAT or sales tax is a state subject. VAT being a tax on sale or purchase of goods within a state is a state subject by virtue of entry 
ఫిఫ్టీ ఫోర్ ఆఫ్ స్టేట్ లిస్ట్ ఆఫ్ ద సెవెంత్ షెడ్యూల్ ఆఫ్ ద కాన్స్టిట్యూషన్ ఆఫ్ ఇండియా హెన్స్ ద సెంట్రల్ గవర్నమెంట్ హాస్ బీన్ ప్లేయింగ్ ద రోల్ ఆఫ్ ద ఫెసిలిటేటర్ ఫర్ సక్సెస్ఫుల్ ఇంప్లిమెంటేషన్ ఆఫ్ వ్యాట్ అండ్ నాట్ ద అదర్ వే రౌండ్ దట్ మీన్స్ కరెక్ట్ ఆన్సర్ ఇస్ ఆప్షన్ డి ఆప్షన్ ఏ ఇస్ ఆల్సో కరెక్ట్ హియర్ ఇట్ ఇస్ అ మల్టీ పాయింట్ డెస్టినేషన్ బేస్డ్ సిస్టమ్ ఆఫ్ టాక్సేషన్ సో ద కరెక్ట్ ఆన్సర్ ఫర్ ద క్వశ్చన్ ఇస్ ఆప్షన్ డి నౌ మూవింగ్ ఆన్ టు ద సెకండ్ క్వశ్చన్ దిస్ క్వశ్చన్ ఇస్ అబౌట్ మెహాలిట్స్ కన్సిడర్ ద ఫాలోయింగ్ స్టేట్మెంట్స్ స్టేట్మెంట్ వన్ డాల్ మెన్ అండ్ మెన్ హెర్స్ ఆర్ మెహాలిథిక్ స్ట్రక్చర్స్ స్టేట్మెంట్ టూ ఆల్ ద మెహాలిట్స్ ఆర్ సెపుల్ క్లర్ ఇన్ నేచర్ స్టేట్మెంట్ త్రీ అడిచనల్లూర్ ఇన్ తమిళనాడు అండ్ బ్రహ్మగిరి ఇన్ కర్ణాటక ఆర్ ఇంపార్టెంట్ మెహాలిథిక్ సైట్స్ ఆఫ్ ఇండియా విచ్ ఆఫ్ ద స్టేట్మెంట్స్ గివెన్ అబౌ విస్ ఆర్ ఆర్ కరెక్ట్ ఆప్షన్ ఏ వన్ ఓన్లీ ఆప్షన్ బి వన్ అండ్ టూ ఓన్లీ ఆప్షన్ సి టూ ఓన్లీ అండ్ ఆప్షన్ డి వన్ అండ్ త్రీ ఓన్లీ సి స్టేట్మెంట్ వన్ ఇస్ కరెక్ట్ డాల్మెన్స్ అండ్ మెన్హర్స్ ఆర్ మెహాలిట్స్ స్టేట్మెంట్ టూ ఇస్ ఇన్ కరెక్ట్ సి సెపుల్ క్లర్ మీన్స్ అ స్మాల్ రూమ్ ఆర్ మోన్యుమెంట్ దట్ ఇస్ కట్ ఇన్ రాక్ ఆర్ బిల్ట్ ఆఫ్ స్టోన్ ఇన్ విచ్ ఎ డెడ్ పర్సన్ ఇస్ లైడ్ ఆర్ బరీడ్ సో ఇట్ యాక్చువల్లీ కంటైన్స్ ద మోర్టల్ రిమైండ్స్ ఆఫ్ వన్ ఆర్ మోర్ హ్యూమన్ బీయింగ్స్ ఆల్ ద మెహాలిట్స్ దట్స్ నాట్ కంటైన్ డెడ్ పర్సన్స్ have this basic idea they may be placed to denote a burial site as a marker but they themselves does not contain mortal remains and this is not the case always dolmens and menhirs are examples of this dolmen is an open structure and menhir is single large stone so the correct answer here is option d 1 and 3 only third statement is also correct we saw in the discussion itself right so here statement 2 is alone incorrect and the correct answer for the question is option d 1 and 3 only now let us move on to the third question this question is about avian influenza which of the following statements is correct with reference to avian influenza option a they are classified into subtypes based on the virus proteins hemagglutinin and neuraminidase option b they do not infect humans or animals option c naturally spreads and affects multiple internal organs of birds and option d both a and c see the correct answer for the question is option d both a and c see option b is incorrect because avian influenza it actually affects humans and animals like swine horse dogs etc So the correct answer for the question is option D both A and C. The main question for the day is displayed here on the screen. Just go through the question, collect the points relevant to the question, write an answer and post it in the comment section below. So with this we came to the end of the news article discussion. If you like today's discussion, hit like, do comment and subscribe to Shankarai's Academy YouTube channel. Thank you. Thank you.